Listen up, guys. Uh, if this got sent to you, there's a reason. So listen up. I already said listen up, but listen twice, three times even. I, I look good, right? You know, it fits well. It's a great suit. I like it. I feel good. And if you look good, and then you feel good, and then you do good, and then good things happen to you because you did good. You want to look good because it's good. So what's good and good is how good this fit is. <laughs> is this good? <laughs> this is your job. Your job is to get the suit and the attire figured out for your side of the wedding party. The thing that's going to be the easiest and most efficient is Generation Tux. You don't have to get all your darn groomsmen in to go get measured and then the suit shows up and they're like a box and they look like they're in like high school prom and the suit's like baggy and everybody's miserable because they look horrible. You go online, you pick what your build is, you click on stuff, like that's it. You just tell them what size you normally wear in like a t-shirt and then boom, the suit shows up like two weeks early and it fits. I know I look good. Look, like you can look like this. I mean, not with this physique, but the suit you can. So, oh wait, hold on. You can also accessorize and look really good. With it showing up two weeks early, if it doesn't fit for whatever weird reason, you can send it back and get one that does fit. The main thing, no one's gonna procrastinate because it's boom, on an app, you're done. It's not on that. It's not on that. Boom. Just do me a favor and point to that and just say, check out Generation Tux. <laughs> check out Generation Tux. Right there. So you two can look this good. Partner. Okay. <laughs> Cue the wife. <laughs> Hi. Now that I have your attention, thank you so much for being here. We haven't formally been introduced yet, but my name is Jamie Wolfer. I'm a wedding planner who your fiance's probably been watching a few of my videos in the background, so the sound of my voice may be familiar or triggering for some of you. And for that, either you're welcome or I'm very sorry. But in today's video, we are going to be discussing some duties that may be yours. And yes, I said duties, but I'm gonna ask that you maintain some composure throughout this video, maybe take some notes because your fiance needs your help. Now, as a disclaimer up front, I'm not saying you're not being unhelpful, all right? I'm not saying that you're not stepping up to the plate, but I do think uh, discussing the list of traditional responsibilities that may or may not be yours could really help out your sweetie uh, in, this, in this time of life, because as I'm sure you've picked up, it could be a little bit stressful. But in this week's video, we're gonna talk about traditional groom responsibilities. This could be for uh, the lesser engaged, <laughs> no pun intended, partner in the wedding planning process. So without further ado, 11 things that you should either completely be responsible for or heavily involved in, unless you and your partner decide otherwise. Let's just jump right on into it. Most commonly, you're probably going to be the most interested in anything that is food or fun focused, right? Like you're going to care what kind of appetizers are served or what's going to be on the dessert table. Lord knows that's what my husband was, right? He's like, just tell me what food's going to be there and what beer is going to be there uh, and if, if we're going to have any fun and that's all I need. There's obviously a lot more that goes into wedding planning than that though. Uh, so I wish this video existed for him when we got married. So I'm, I'm, I'm passing along the favor to you. First of all, guest list. It is your responsibility to come up with your half of the guest list. It is also your responsibility to procure those addresses. Whether you're inviting 50 people or 150 people, getting physical addresses or email addresses, if you're going that route and going digital, takes a lot of time and takes a lot of work. So it makes sense to split this equitably. So if there's someone on your side of the list, then it should be your responsibility to make sure that you know how to contact them. You can of course employ good old mom. She probably has an address book somewhere lying around the house. Give her a call. You know that puppy's up to date. Or if it's a handful of friends, send out a group text. Plus they're, they're your guests, they're yours, so. Help a sister out. Number two, the budget. Now this big B word haunts so many people who watch this channel. So this is probably something that's affecting your fiance greatly. Whether you're getting money from family members or contributors, or you guys are pulling from savings, or using credit card hacking to figure out how to leverage credit card points for potentially a free honeymoon. There's a ton of ways that money can come into this situation, but you need to figure out how to manage it properly. You wanna make sure that you are spending money on things that are important to you 
and your fiance. So this might require you speaking up and saying, hey, a DJ is actually pretty important to me. It'd be important if we spent a little bit more in that category so we have a really good time, or the food is super important, or I really, really want a photo booth. Let your fiance know what your priorities are and how do you figure out what those are? Well, you basically just imagine like, what do you want your wedding day to look like? Do you wanna spend a ton of time with your family members and guests? Do you wanna get down with your bad self on the dance floor? Do you wanna have tokens and or memories to take away, such as printables from a photo booth? What's the kind of experience that you wanna have? I do have a whole video on priorities. If I haven't scared you away by the end of this video, I do recommend that you go check that out, sit down with your partner and watch that together because it'll really help you define what that looks like. The second issue that I see quite often in our couples when it comes to budgeting is one partner will throw out an arbitrary number and say, this is our budget but you haven't done any research on what things might cost. And oftentimes it can be really difficult for the bride in this situation to explain, hey, that's that's not gonna work in this particular case, or if that's our budget, then we're going to need to DIY. So I would encourage you that if you are the type that just wants to select a number and stick with it, maybe join your fiance in doing some research in what those categories might cost. Because if you want an $8,000 wedding, Friend, you can totally do an $8,000 wedding, but that does mean that you're gonna have to give up some of the creature comforts of a more traditional wedding, such as maybe not having an actual florist or maybe not having an actual DJ. So if a DJ is an important priority to you and you have a smaller budget, understand that you're gonna need to make some concessions here. So how can you support your fiance in those emotional decisions? They're not just financial ones, right? So if you're working on a budget, something's important to you, but it won't fit within the budget, you're going to need to work together to come up with something that fits the bill, no pun intended. Number three, it's your responsibility to choose your wedding party members. And, and I'm going to say this going a step further. You have to actually ask them, why do I say this? Because in so many circumstances with a bride and a groom, it typically tends to be the groom that really takes forever to ask his mates. I don't know what it is. My husband did it. I literally know of one of his dear friends that is going to ask him to be a part of the wedding party and still hasn't. And the wedding is getting much closer in date. This is just a common frequent thing that happens. You already know who your friends are. Maybe talk with your fiance if you, wanna, if you guys wanna have even numbers on each side, but you do have to pick them and then you have to let them know with enough time that they could be like financially prepared to be a part of this. Cause if you've ever been a member of a wedding party, you know, it can be like, sort of expensive sometimes. So you wanna give them time to get ready for that. The fourth thing, it's probably gonna be your responsibility to pick the attire. Your fiance may have a say in this, right? Uh, they may have already picked out a color, a color palette, and kind of given you a general decision or a general range within which they want you to fall or have some sort of input on this category. All of these are gonna be back and forth things, right? Like it's not like you are alone in a black hole doing all this by yourself. You're engaged to someone to be wed. You're going to be making decisions together for a lifetime. So it doesn't mean that you're doing all of this by yourself, but it does mean that you should probably spearhead it. Obviously my favorite is Generation Tux. There's a reason I keep bringing them up. We use them for my own brother's wedding and literally every single groomsman had nothing but amazing things to say about it. From the fit to the quality to the customer service, absolutely incredible. So whether you want a tuxedo, a three-piece suit, or you just wanna wear pants and suspenders, you're gonna need to kind of come up with something here. Oh, and a shirt. <laughs> Pants, suspenders, and a shirt, preferably. Unless, never mind, we're not even going there. In addition to that, it is your responsibility to make sure they order their attire on time. This is common. It's very common that we see a certain group of people really just not staying on top of the ball on this one. Um, and I'm not intending to stereotype necessarily. I'm just saying based off the history and the patterns that I've seen, this most frequently happens, all right? And we're not judging. Life is full, but your fiance is already chasing down a bajillion other things. So if you could be responsible for making sure the six dudes that you've selected to stand next to you order their suits, because there's probably going to be one or two that like you're still chasing. Respectfully, be on top of them to make sure they get those orders placed at least four months in advance. It sounds really far ahead of time, but trust me, you don't want to be blowing up someone's phone eight weeks before your event because they haven't placed their suit order yet. Number five, this is like uber traditional and is most likely not the case, but you're going to want a uh, to have a, a presence here, okay? And that's honeymoon planning. If you are taking your honeymoon immediately after your wedding. I know my husband and I waited a few years and that's what worked out best for us financially and it just made sense. Um, but if you are going to go on one immediately afterwards, help. 
please help because your fiance is already planning the largest event they've ever planned in their life and then to plan the most epic trip of their lives like immediately afterwards that's a lot for one person to handle especially if they're going to school or they're employed and you probably are experiencing those things too but we want to make sure there's like an equitable exchange of, of services here right so traditionally a groom would be the one that makes all of the travel plans with input from the fiance of course but that also means booking hotels booking flights and getting all the travel documents in order now you can't take a passport photo for your fiance but potentially you can schedule the appointment to have that done. Now I know there's a lot of decisions involved when uh, planning a honeymoon, so if you need a little bit of help, we put together this quiz to help you figure out your perfect honeymoon, whether it's on the beach or it's in the mountains, whatever your budget happens to be, you're gonna wanna check this out. It'll make that job a lot easier for you. Next up, I don't know what number we're on, transportation. Whether you are booking like a limo, or some sort of car service to take your wedding party and photographer and videographer, if you're having those from point A to point B to point C, this is a very easy, straightforward, like you just need to have vehicles to move you from place to place. If you are not hiring someone, then you will need to figure out who's driving what car type plan. I cannot tell you the amount of times on the day of a wedding where all of a sudden someone goes, how are we gonna get the wedding party to the ceremony? And whether it's because y'all have been having beers all morning or there's just not enough parking spaces at the ceremony location, it gets to be a little bit stressful, a little bit complicated. We want to smooth that out earlier. So let's have some sort of transportation plan in place before you get to the big day. So it's just one thing off the list. Next up is rehearsal dinner. Now again, it bears repeating that we're going for the most traditional approach here, right? Now, traditionally, when a groom's involved, the groom's parents will host and pay for the rehearsal dinner. That's the meal that directly follows the rehearsal where you bring all the wedding party and you practice walking up and down. It is just as boring as it sounds. I mean, if you have a wedding planner to spice things up and make it a little bit more entertaining and make sure it goes pretty quickly, it's not that bad. Actually, it's not that bad in general. I don't know I'm making it sound like that. It does help everyone to feel better the next day because they know where to walk, they know what to do with their hands. Like a rehearsal is important. It's just not gonna be the most delightful part of your weekend. It could be something as high-end as booking out a restaurant and covering all the food and drinks there, or as simple as pizza and beer. That's what we did for our wedding. In fact, no parents paid for that. We did that ourselves. But if you could help facilitate that, and help make some of those decisions, it removes some of that decision fatigue from your fiance's shoulders. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. I think we're on number eight, gifts for your wedding party, like your side of the wedding party. You know them quite well. Otherwise they wouldn't be standing next to you unless perhaps you have a sibling of your fiance standing with you. And then, you know, you can get some support from them. Again, this is not just like you're out there in the wilderness with nothing but a backpack full of tools to try to figure this out. You have a partner in this, but it will be your responsibility to figure out what gifts to give them if you are giving gifts. Our staff, we all went to our husbands on this one and actually asked them what they would like to receive as a gift, like as a groomsman gift or being a part of a wedding party. And we put together that for you right here if it helps simplify things. We've got the musician, we've got the 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 guy that has too much paracord, okay? The more outdoorsy survivor type. We've got, oh gosh, I don't if we've got at least five different avatars <laughs> and a list of things that they would like to receive as gifts. So if that helps, check it out. Number nine is uh, in this day and age a little bit more optional, but again, traditionally, we're going to go based off of what the, we traditionally say, you would be expected to give a thank you toast. This may frighten the dickens out of some of you. I will say that a lot of couples don't do this, okay? If it's not your jam, it's totally okay. I would recommend, you know, maybe even just at the rehearsal dinner when it's just the closer family members and friends standing up and saying a little thank you because you probably know that you're, everyone around you is putting in a lot of effort to make this day happen or taking off work or taking a day of their lives to come celebrate with you. So a, a quick thank you, even not in a big grandiose way at your wedding goes a long way. Speaking of thank you, you please help with thank you notes. Please, please help with thank you notes. <laughs> and don't give me this, well, her handwriting's better than mine. Or no, 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 because that's already, like, this is usually when the event's over, although you can start writing thank you notes the second you receive them. I recommend doing it that way, but most people wait until after their event. But etiquette-wise, like, you're allowed to send a thank you note the second you receive it. You don't have to wait till after the event. So maybe get a head start on those or help your fiance get a head start on those. But Please don't use your handwriting as the excuse to get out of writing these because if you invited 150 guests and let, even if you got 40 presents or 40 different sorts of gifts, that's a lot of handwritten, uber personal things to send to people. You can pick a script, okay? And just like insert personal detail here, but please help your fiance out with that. And lastly, decision fatigue. 
You may not care what color the napkins are. I don't blame you. You may not care what song you walk down the aisle to. You may not care what type of chairs are rented. You may not care how many hours you have the bar open for. You may not care about doing a first look or not. You may not care about, oh gosh, a whole, like, so, the, the, the style of the invitations, right? Or the type of stamps that you use, or whether or not you're going to use a wax seal on the back of them, or if you should send to save the date, or if the menu should be printed on cardstock or vellum. You may not care, and you have full permission to not care about those things, because planning a wedding doesn't make you a different person, but also doesn't make your fiancé a different person either. So whether or not you care about the details, like the color of the chair that you'll be seated on during your reception, doesn't mean that that decision doesn't need to be made. So what we tend to see is brides oftentimes in this case are, are expected to make all of these decisions and all of a sudden be a really decisive person and good at managing large events, and totally balanced out with the rest of their lives. That's not exactly the case. Feel free to say something really gracious like, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not really invested in this detail, but if you'd like me to help you make a decision, I'd be glad to. There you go. You're not all of a sudden invested in linen colors, but if your fiance comes to you and says like, I, I don't want to make another decision. I can't make another decision. I feel like my head's going to explode. Please help me. You can be like, I mean, I'm going to be honest. This, it's not a big important detail to me, but I can tell that you're, you, you would like support in this, right? Like you just, you just, if you want me to just pick one, then I'll just pick one. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of your relationship, right? I don't because your fiance may be like, no, that's the wrong one after you pick. I don't know. I don't know. But just bear in mind that they are making a ton of decisions and even just having someone else to listen, to help them narrow down decisions and or make decisions for them is a very, very powerful person to have in their corner during such a stressful time. Now, this is just a short list of the most traditional things. There are so many other ways that you can jump in and you can help out or make your priorities or preferences known. This is a day to celebrate the two of you. So if there's something that's really important to you, vocalize that. You're literally heading into decades of communication and compromising and money conversations. So the best time to start is now. If there's something else that you find yourself interested in, jump in and take something off your fiance's plate. Give them some more breathing room because this is a big event. That's why you keep hearing my voice because they may or may not be drowning or annoying the tar out of you with that wedding stuff. I don't know your relationship. I don't know your business, but this it's like, it's a big deal. It's a big time. You know that, I know that. So what can we do to make sure that both of you are coming into this as equitably as possible? So that's all we have for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hopefully this doesn't serve as the list of the only things that you do, but maybe a springboard to get you more involved, make your priorities known, make your wishes known, and make sure that your wedding day feels uniquely like the two of you. If you like this video, jump on down there, hit the like button, and subscribe to this channel for more tips and tricks for the modern day bride and occasionally passive aggressive videos directed towards grooms. No, it wasn't intended to be passive aggressive. It might have come across that way, but it's not where my heart was. And until next week, bye guys. It looks perfect for Marion. It looks perfect for Marion, someone? Yeah. Can you say it one more time? Give you candy. <laughs> How many? <laughs> Three. Aww, uh, that's Five. What about 11? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what does he look like? Um, uh, he, he looks like the government <laughs> because the government lives at. But you said he looks perfect for what? Marion someone. He looks perfect for Marion someone. So either a job with a great retirement plan, or for Marion someone. Yeah. 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 Thank you for your help. You can go get your candy now. <laughs> the government. <laughs>